Who read the book uh, Made in America by Sam Walton? Was it good? Amazing. That's why I have this. Honestly, that's one of the best books I've ever read. So you should, if you haven't read that book, you're really a responsible businessman. <laughs> Jeff Bezos makes it mandatory reading for every executive at Amazon. It, it is forced. They must read it. Made in America by Sam Walton. There's a lot, but I'm going to talk about one main thing right now. And that is that he talks about <laughs> what's that? <laughs> yeah, you don't want to know what Rhett did to that book. <laughs> yeah, I was hoping it was water damage. <laughs> it does seem a little, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> So in that book, he talks about how the market that he was in, which was uh, basically, you know, convenience stores, like just stores that sell things that people need, and all the evolutions that went through. And he talks about how, like, the only people that he said he saw so many people come and go over time. Some people would be winning, and then they'd be bankrupt, and like everyone comes and goes over time. But the only people who survived were what he called slick operators. And what he talks about is that at the start of any new market, the main people in it are promoters. And when at first, you're a, when any entrepreneur starts in business, they're a scrappy promoter. They're kind of pulling rabbits out of the hat to just promote and get customers, drum up demand, get attention. That's how you start. But then you have to evolve into an operator. And an operator is someone who got, has good management, good operations, good support. They've got good financials, good accounting systems. They're, you know, they're, they're efficient. And they're looking at how they can make every process better, faster, stronger, cheaper, more reliable. And they're constantly getting better. And this is happening in the internet marketing industry right now. It was full of promoters, but they're all dying right now. A lot of them are already dead because you just can't do that anymore. The market's moved and now you need tighter operations. And you also cannot get to eight figures without being an operator. You can't be someone who just does good promos and is charismatic and has a big social media following and all of that and make eight figures. Maybe you might do it for a little bit, but then it won't happen any anymore. Especially as the market evolves. Because the slick operators will, will squeeze you out of everything. And so they're really, it, it goes from like, you know, being a promoter to being a operator. And this is what, this is the thing that you have to do to get to eight figures. It's 100% it's required, mandatory. You cannot get to eight figures as a promoter, you need to have dialed in operations. And this is everything, your support, your books, your financials, your every system, every little nut and bolt in the entire business. You have to know it. You have to know it inside out. You have to have it machined so it's going perfectly. You have to know how to troubleshoot it. And you have to have other people watching it. And you have to have the whole machine humming and balanced and like tuned to, to get there. And like to, for Sam Walton to like achieve that, you know, he was extreme if you see the things he did on trying to make things efficient. He would, he even bought an airplane so he could fly over new developments and watch the traffic patterns and see where the main roads were and see how the town was growing and see where he was going to put his stores and then he would go into other stores and see how they were laying them out, how they were positioning the products, how they were buying it, how they were pricing it. Like this dude was a fanatic. I heard a story when he was in Mexico, uh, he got arrested because the, the Mexican authorities, he was actually in a supermarket measuring the, the, some 
The distance yeah. between shelves, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, I thought it was, it was a crazy man up there. <laughs> he would literally go there and measure things, like with a tape measure. He'd bring a voice recorder and interview like all of the clerks and the people in there. Like he was a fanatic. And he just wanted to machine, he, like just if it was a little edge in anything, he did it. And that meant that no one could beat him, ever. Because he would get the most yield on his stores out of anyone by a mile. So people would think that, oh, you've just got some store in Arkansas or whatever. How do you say that? State? Arkansas. Arkansas. So I said it right. So doesn't it end with an S? Yes. I don't get that, man. Like, mm, I still don't understand how that happens. Did they just, just be like, oh, fuck that S. Don't worry about it. Just, just, just put a W there. <laughs> And um, then they would be like, oh, because he's running some store out in the WAPs. But, like, he was making way more money than, like, some of the stores in, like, Manhattan and other things because he just had such good operations. His business was so dialed in. And it, was, it goes way deeper than just promotions. It would go into his fulfillment centers, like, where he would have stock his products his culture that he would train people on. He also figured it out how to uh, make, like, how to turn minimum wage employees in low income areas into people who were more efficient and productive than educated people in high income areas, right? He figured out how to squeeze efficiency everywhere. And that's how he was able to win. And what's crazy is when you read it, you'll realize that this dude really did just start with one damn store. And he would try and pull rabbits out of hats to get more customers. He would put an ice cream machine outside. Or he'd have like some sort of entertainment, like a clown juggling outside. He was a promoter like that. And he would go and buy the products himself in his car and bring them back in his car and put them in the store. And like He started off with one damn store in Arkansas. And then he just grew it brick by brick, like store by store until it became the largest company on earth. And he was the richest man in the world and, and Walmart was the wealthiest, was the biggest company in the world at a point. And then Jeff Bezos learned from him and turned out, learned how to make that on the internet. And that's what Amazon is, it's Walmart on the internet. And he ended up taking over his mentor. But his entire, you can tell his entire business is based off what he read in Sam Walton's book. That's why he makes it mandatory reading for every executive. Yeah, but on c company value, and he is like, am, like Walmart's freaking out trying to figure out how to do online, because they're not willing to give up their offline, they can't master online, you know? So like, it's, they're gonna win that race, Amazon, absolutely. And so, if you wanna get from there to there, you have to become an operator. So you can't think, oh, I'm not good at management, or I'm not good at the numbers, or I'm not good at the financials, or I'm not good at, at the details, or I'm not good at this. I'm just good at just being charismatic on the internet, right? It's fine. You can think that, but you won't get to eight figures. If you want to, you've got to change. You've got to evolve into a different beast. Can you give an example of like a lesson in that book that would apply to a webinar? Sure. So, like in the beginning, Sam Walton only really knew how to promote and work hard, right? That was all he knew. But then he had to learn accounting for his business. So he would literally just come in with he'd carry his books, like his his financial statements, to to like events, and be like, "Can you please look at these and tell me like what this means or how we could save on this?" Or like he had he wanted to learn everything about his entire business, and you have to do this like. Andrew was a CPA before, or well, he still is, because I guess you never aren't. And then he, so he knows accounting well. It's one of the main reasons why he's been able to do it, because you need to have that understanding. If you don't understand the accounting side of your business, you'll never really get to eight figures. So you need to understand that. And then, and most entrepreneurs just, just hand that off to their accountant and don't look at it till they've got to file their tax returns, right? You've got to know that thing well. 
So we'll put it up here, like you got accounting. I'm not saying you have to do your accounting, but you need to know what the hell it means. And you have to have it, like, have a bookkeeper reconcile your books at least once a week. It should really be daily. We have someone reconciling our things all day, every day. It's too late by then. If you've made a mistake, you, you can't catch it. And one of the key numbers you're looking at once a week. Cash. <laughs> That's the only thing I have my eye on ever. And I've actually set up my business to a point where I don't even, because we only use debit cards and because we don't have credit and because we only use cash, and if we make money, it goes into an account as cash, and if we spend money, it goes out of an account as cash, I know what we're doing on cash just by looking at that number. Because if we're going up, it's going up. If we're going down, it's going down. But when you have credit cards, multiple accounts, and all of this shit, it's all over here, and it hasn't hit here yet. And I don't like the idea of making a mistake there, so I don't use it. So I engineered the whole business so that I can just glance at different things and, and sense the whole... I can sense like the health and the pulse of the entire machine just with a couple of glances at different things. So you're just looking at the bank account level at the end of the day and, and watching that that number consistently rise. Sure, it might have any, but it overall consistently rises. Is that it in a, at a high level? Well, that is just checking that you're going to stay alive, right? <laughs> that's, but that, it, that's just the start of it. That's my most... That's my biggest concern, because if we do run out of cash, we will cease to exist, right? So that is like the survival number. And we can go backwards on it, but not for too long. And then after that comes like looking at your ads, because that's where most of our expense is, and what our ROI is on that, on cash and on revenue. And I want to make sure it's at least 20% on cash. And then I want to look at you know, my overheads and my payroll and all of those things and what those are and how those are impacting it and then where we should be spending more money, where we should be spending less, constantly looking at it. Every dollar should be going to work in the most efficient way possible. So, so if your course is two grand, hypothetically, uh, It means that I'm willing, I'm willing to spend uh, 1,000 and make 1,200 in cash yeah. minimum. Sorry. If I'm spending a grand and making a grand in cash, I know I'm actually losing money yeah. because there's merchant fees, there's going to be some chargebacks, there's overhead, there's all sorts. Yeah. So if I'm making that, I'm losing. But if the 20% margin there, it means that worst case, I'm probably breaking even, right? And I'm going to collect on the accounts receivable, but I try to do my math on the most dire numbers possible. Because that way I know that I'm being very, like, prudent. So you're spending massive. Yeah, it is. So Sam, when, when you think about the cards that you use to pay for the expenses of the business, do you have, are you, like, part of, like, uh, any like loyalty program, so you get like points and you end up getting all these like first come supplies? No. Does it get acquired millions? We don't even use a card for ads, it's hooked straight up to our bank account. It's not even like. No, but do because they close like damn cards. It's like fraud protection, ads go down for like half a day. So, like, that there costs too much money. I can't afford for fraud protection to happen. So, we miss that link. We just connect our bank account straight to Facebook. Then there's no card limits. Then there's no issue with the card declining. It just doesn't break. Remove the links that can break. Sorry, so, that the end of the so I hooked my Facebook ads account directly to my bank account, not through a credit card or even a debit card. Is that an option for everybody? Yeah. It is an option for you to have credit card. You want to add something out. Once you do that, your account will be limited to $50 per day. And then you have to do the threshold again and again. 
So if you're spending 1K a day in credit cards and you switch to your bank account, your ad will be like that out. Yeah, don't switch your main account. Who's had their Facebook ad stop because their cards declined? Yeah. yeah. Used to happen to us like twice a week. So like, well, I was like, this sucks. And then my team would have to call me because I was the only person that could call the bank. And then my phone was off or I was busy doing something. So like, just, it's a potential issue that's going to happen. So you can remove it. And the way to get around it is create a different Facebook ads account and link that one to the bank and then start spending a bit in that and then get its limit released and then you can use that one. Don't do it to your main one. Yeah. But it won't break when, once you've done that. Provided you've got money in your bank account, right? <laughs> can I just clarify, if you link to your, so instead of Facebook taking the money out of your credit card, it takes it straight out of your account? Yeah. And did you have to go like, through an approval for that? It might not work in Australia. I don't know. It might only be an American thing. You'd have to look. Okay. Was there a certain um, limit to how much you can spend with Facebook before you can qualify to get up to the $1,000 or $2,000 per day? No, I think it's just time. They want to get. They want to see you use it for about a week, and they want to see the payments keep working for a week before they start letting you spend more. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's kind of like Facebook, uh, like Google, there's a threshold. And um, as long as your card's not declining at a certain threshold, they'll increase your limit. Yep. Yeah. And then our Google account's hooked directly to our bank too. Yeah. And then, you know, a lot of things are hooked directly without cards because then there's no issue for error there. And then we look at our numbers all the time, every day, all day. I have a full-time bookkeeper looking at them all day, every day. And then... Is she, is she just reconciling every day? Yeah, he's just looking at everything every day and giving me a cash report every day, telling me what's going on. I have to approve payroll before every run. And then different reports on different expenses. If any expense comes up and he doesn't know what it is, he'll query it with me. So we don't miss anything. If a cent moves, I'll see it. Sure. Yeah. So like you've got accounting, then you've got management, and what you'll probably find, like I found, is that you have to build, you have to do a lot still, even when, like as an entrepreneur, even when you have staff, you can't become a, a just a full-time manager because you have to build. So I have to build the courses. I have to do like the Q and A calls. I also have to write copy, I have to build the funnels, I have to do different things. And a lot of my time is spent building, and builders aren't managers. So I can't be a good manager, and if I try to, then I won't be a good builder. This is a common problem a lot of people fall into as soon as they get some people on their team. So you need to hire a manager once you've got like more than five people. And actually, I was thinking about this this morning. You, you're per the best person on your team right now should become your manager. You don't need to hire a manager. The person who already knows the most about your business, knows every detail, every in and out, they should become the manager. Can you define that? Oh, so knowing everything. Knowing everything. So Jesse became my general manager because he was a customer of mine first, and he had been a customer of mine for years. So he knew the product and believed in it and bought in it and was applying it and all of that. Then he had worked with me on Facebook ads, then he had done sales calls, and he had seen everything happen since day one. So I was like, at first I was like, I need a manager so I should hire a manager. But then I started looking at managers and realized how useless they were. Because like, people who are managers, like they come in with a suit and stuff. Remember the people we interviewed? It's like, holy shit, there's no way I'm letting that guy near my business. And then I was like, it's actually Jesse, he's perfect fit, because he, he knows it all. And then he's learned how to do the management. But the most important thing is knowing everything. 
every in and out, every detail, every nuance, and how the whole machine works. Because you can learn the actual management side of it. But learning that thing there, and liking it, and caring about it, and being passionate about it, that's the most important thing. How would you describe that? I would say it's like, it really depends where you are with hiring. Because um, it's kind of like, like you're either building a department maybe. So let's say you've got your sales reps, but you're, maybe you're hiring someone in support. But if you're hiring your first support person, you need to say, OK, what are their APIs going to be? Like your tickets per day? What's the quality going to be? So you're like designing what that those KPI should look like for that position and that role, and then you're hiring that. So then you have to figure out okay, what's the job description going to look like? What are their accountabilities and deliverables? What are they going to report to you? And these sorts of, kind of structural things. But once you build that out once, then it's just more of a check-in to make sure that they're doing that repeatedly. So it changes. So you got to like design it and build whatever that management system is first, and then it's just checking in to make sure that they're delivering on their KPIs for whatever the department or their role is. I think we've got like 50 people in our team, and I'm pretty sure I only hired four of them. So the manager often ends up building the whole teams. Like, so I'll tell Jesse, Jesse, I need you to build us a support team. So he'll start writing the job description, like, like, and then, you know, trying to find people, finding them, onboarding them, teaching them what to do, trying to develop the systems to be efficient with it. Then once we've got enough support people, then he has to hire a manager to manage the support people, make sure the manager's doing the job, then he can move. Then he's building like a, a webinar live chat team, hiring all of the people, managing them, then putting a manager in, then managing the manager, and then once they've got it, move. Next team. Done that again, next team. Next team. He builds the teams gets the system, and then puts the manager in charge of the team, makes sure the manager's doing it, then he manages the managers, right? It's like, without that, I wouldn't, would never would have grown. But, okay, so here's an example for that, right? So, if I do that, right, there are certain things that happen, questions students have, whatever, that only I can answer because no, nobody on my team, like it's amazing, nobody on my team, I don't think they've ever actually sat down and watched my webinar. Okay, so the first thing all of our, all of our team does is go through our whole course. And the webinar. So they have to watch the entire course. But right now, if I take them off of what they do and have them do that, it's going to be chaos. Yeah, so this, this is why you can't, you know, you've got to, you need to first of all get a manager. Or what you need to find the person who knows the most about your business and make them a manager, right? And then you need to give people start like thinking about the business structure. Um, like a really key role definitely has to be the structuring, which is kind of like management. So you always want to think like, what's the design of the business like? Who are the managers? What are the departments? What are the different functions? Then who are the people in the team? And what are their KPIs? What are they actually doing? What's success? What's failure? What's average? And then is everyone, uh, all the eyes on everyone, making sure everyone's doing the right thing at all, the, at all times, right? There is way too much going on in my business for me to know about it. Like. So I have to trust different people are watching different people that are watching different people that are watching different people. But you don't, you don't like have like a huge control issue with that? What do you, well, I can't control it. If I tried to, it w it, I wouldn't. But I am controlling it by letting other people control it. But what I'm saying is like the trust that they won't fuck it up. Well, sometimes they do. But then they learn. And if they fuck it up and don't learn, then they get fired. Like, but everyone's going to make some mistakes, right? The main thing is that after someone makes a mistake, they generally learn from it, right? So you, it's going to happen. So if, if you have people that have constantly fucked something up over and over and over again, but you don't fire them just because you feel bad, that's like a bad thing, right? <laughs> <laughs>
It depends though, like, because it, because I know this feeling, because sometimes you think it's your fault because there's just no management and no support structure well, there, and like. These operational gurus are teaching. Like, it's like, there's this new thing, like, the, the, like these, that's what it is. It's like, there's these guys, they charge, you know, how much ever for these masterminds, these programs that teach you how to run your company and create SOPs. And, they, they always preach that, you know, it's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault, you're the leader, your team's fine, it's your fault, it's your fault. That's what they all Most of the time, honestly, it is. Because the management's so bad that the damn person doesn't have what's there to, right. to help them. And so most of the time it is, I'd have to agree. But if the management's good and the person has the good management and they continue to fuck up, it's their fault. Okay. Yeah. And they fire. Yes. But you have to know, like, it's their fault. Right. Jesse, do you work with Sam when defining the KPIs for each role? Do you sometimes, sometimes, but oftentimes not. No, he will, he'll actually, we don't define the KPIs until we've let people do it. Because we have no idea, we'd just be guessing. So like when Jesse built the support team, he hired all the different people, put the manager in place, and then he had to keep babysitting the manager. And then he couldn't go and do other things, so we had to get rid of the manager and bring another manager in. And then as soon as we did that, it, the performance just went poof. And then he could leave that manager to do his job. And I never once knew what the KPIs were. Like, or, or we had any design into it. it G Jesse and the manager did it. So, Sam, you talk to any of your customers, except through your calls? No. Maybe a mastermind member if it's a, ser if a proper serious question, but like, no, I do the live streams for, the, for that, and then I do the, the Q&A for Quantum, and then the Q&A for Up Level, and that's the place to ask me. I might reply every now and then in the Facebook group, but that's it. It's impossible for me to be able to talk to everyone all the time. And surprisingly, no one ever messages me, ever. I might get one message on Facebook a week and zero emails in a month from anyone. I get like you guys been a in a situation yet where you've had to hmm? fire a couple of people? What? Have you guys been in a situation yet where you've had to fire? Yeah. People? Yeah. yeah. But honestly they it's they've just known it anyway, so it's like not even hard because they're just they sucked and they knew they sucked. So when we told them they're like fine. <laughs> Is that just because like, they keep making mistakes? Like, no, they just weren't into it. Like, they, it was just a way to make money. Anyone that's doing something just for the money, they're going to get fired. You can generally see through that in the interview process, right? No? Or is it sometimes, but also sometimes, it, in the beginning, you're more desperate. So you're kind of willing to hire anyone. And then later on, when you, you're not, then you can start flushing out that. But quite often, some of your first hires are out of desperation. Because you just need fucking somebody. You don't even care. And it is better than nothing. But later on, you've got to make sure that their performance keeps going up. You have to lift the bar. Maybe you can do something like what Zappos does, where after like two weeks after training, you pay them $2,000 to leave. And then if they take it, it's a good thing. If they yeah. don't, then you know that they're there for good reasons. Or you can do what GE does and just fire the bottom 10% every year. Not really. I mean, if someone's absolutely low performing, I mean, that means that they're not, yeah. How important do you think it is, at least for your core team, to have them in an office close to you? Not in the, it's not necessary in the beginning. I think once you get up to a, like, you know, if you're doing, I think the right time to probably do that is like five, 600 grand a month sort of thing or maybe even 300 grand a month, but. Just like you can't, you can't. Like if they're working from home, how do you know why, like if there's an issue with their performance, how do you know if it's because they're not? Well, what is the role, right? So if it's customer support, it's better for us to just look at their numbers and help scout than to actually see them. Because if when you see someone and they're not there, you might be like, oh, they see slacking off, which is totally irrational. 
But if you look at their numbers, you're like, how many tickets have they done today? What's their happiness score? And how are they averaging for the week and all of that? And it's better to just manage them like that. It's better. So who would you say is important to have an office? Um, I wanted to get an office purely because I wanted to do like my platform, which was like I needed a product manager who could understand my vision of that and then manage all of my engineers and front end designers and all that, which is complex. And I didn't really want to have to have that conversation over the virtually and all of that, you know? So I wanted that person to be there. I actually wanted an office so that all the managers could be here. And then I don't really mind where their team members are. So like we often have the managers here, but their team is virtual. Make sense? Yeah, I got it. I see. Because I, I quite like the idea, especially when we get a bit bigger, is that you know, all the managers are in here so I can have that tight relationship and I can just ping anywhere I want and get a feedback of what's going on in that part, make a decision, make a decision. But their team members, they don't need to be here. Depends on the role. Like, support definitely doesn't. Live chat and that definitely doesn't. I think strategy sessions, they don't need to be because they need silence. Um, and then engineers, like developers, they don't need to be. You, you don't want them to be. They're too expensive here. And then you want, um, but I, I wanted the media buyers to be here, marketing manager to be here, data scientist to be here, product manager. Yeah. It's like all the stuff I do myself. <laughs> the hard stuff I wanted close to me, but yeah. But honestly, if I didn't hire, it's so hard to hire somebody yourself while doing everything else that it was like the most draining thing, the hardest thing ever to just make like one or two hires. But as soon as I put a team in place, like Jesse and a management team, they just hired everyone. So like who hired my Facebook media buyer and the YouTube media buyer was Fisher. So I hired Nick Fisher, then he hired his team. So you don't really want to hire someone's team. You kind of want to hire them and then let them build their team. Like the hardest part is to get those first people that, and, and really to teach them. Because it takes so much time like to teach them at the beginning the, the all the different uh, parts. Yeah, those first people, people. Yeah, that's a good question. So I think the first thing you want to, you just, the best way to know when to hire is when the pain is extreme. So, like you said, it was support. Because oh, we do that 100 units of time thing, right? Where is it all going? You're probably going into your customer support. So the first person you should have hired, which you did, was a customer support person. That's when you do it. Then, you know, if, it's, if you're maxed out on strategy sessions and customer support isn't really an issue, which is more common in high ticket, then it's a sales rep. And then what about when they get maxed out? It's another sales rep. What about when they would get maxed out? It's another sales rep. But now you need someone to manage those sales reps. Then you get one of them. But now you need someone to do the ads better to fill all of their calendars. Well, now it's a media buyer. But now you've got all of this other shit going on, so now it's a community manager. But now you've got too many people, so now it's a general manager to manage them. All right? Do you have a who starts with sales people first, then then? You start with what, where the pain is. Because in your case, it was customer support. But I know in most people's case with the strategy sessions, it's the phone. And as soon as they've got that nailed and then it's a few more sales reps, then it comes to the ads part. And then once you get those two parts nailed, it comes into operations. Like a community manager, that's very helpful because you've got the calls running, you need the recordings running, you've got the Facebook groups running. You need someone there to kind of balance all of that and then make sure it runs like clockwork. You don't want to drop the ball anywhere. And then um, customer support becomes an issue, and you want to make sure you make that good. Good support makes you more money. What would you call those people? What customer support reps? Yeah. What's yep. the role then? What? When you, when you hire them, what are you looking for? What, what is it that, what's the title? Or? What do we call them? Yeah, just support rep. Support yeah. rep? Yeah. OK. Do you have a map of all the different think, people you should be hiring? At basic. Well, it, it differs. But on, on like what your issue is and what your model is, 
Like, it's where the pain is. That's always where the person should be hired. But once you get to your stage where you've got as many people as you have, you need a manager. You can't hire any more people. You are the manager right now. Yeah, exactly. But you can't manage because yeah. you need to build. But you can't build because you need to manage. Yeah. So you're not building or managing. Yeah, it's, it's a very Drinking. vicious cycle. <laughs> yeah, you're going you're gonna to roast me for that all weekend. Yeah, yeah it's a vicious cycle because you can't. Yeah. You need good management is so important. Without that, the whole thing would just go chaos. Because everybody needs to be watched in detail. They need to be fact-checked. They need to be, if, all eye, if someone's eyes aren't on someone all the time, they're going to play up. And where do you find these managers? Um, well, I told you Jesse was a customer of mine, and then he, was, he knew the most about my business, so he just became the manager, even though he had never really done management. But then I just told him to learn it. <laughs> and then he did over time. And then Fisher, for marketing, I found him from another company. Did you start as a PA buyer? Did you start as a uh, Sort of. I mean, both me and Sam were on Facebook when we started. Because Sam had to teach me up on his style, which was pretty similar to mine already, but there was nuances I had to learn and so on. And still, for a long time. I found Nick because he knew how to do Infusionsoft, copywriting, Facebook ads, YouTube ads, and funnels, and like JVs, and like social media. He knew everything. I was like, wow, this guy's like pretty much running the entire company. Which he pretty much was, which was why it was extremely hard to get him, because the whole other company was about to collapse. If, so I had to wean him off, because I didn't want to hurt that other company. You know what I mean? So like, I, I like people that, have, that know everything. They make good managers. The Google call them T-shaped people. So they know a lot. They know a lot about quite a broad range of things, but they can go deep on one specific thing. Because you don't want someone who only knows one piece, but not all the other pieces. They've got to know a lot. So thinking that I could find someone that knew ads, Facebook, copywriting, JVs, all of it, I was like, man. And then I. I was talking to Nick by chance. Well, actually, what happened is he messaged me wanting to trade like knowledge because he said he knew a lot about YouTube ads, and he wanted to tell me what was working on YouTube in exchange for me telling him what was working on Facebook. So I was like, oh, yeah, cool. Then I worked out. I was like, wait a minute. He's actually going out of his way to, to do this. I was like, no one does that. He's actually going out of his way to make the company better. And then I knew that I found out that he knew everything about everything. And then on that call, I was like, actually, do you want a job? <laughs> and then that was that. But you want to find those people that have broad knowledge. It's like Jesse knows everything about my business. Fishing knows everything about marketing and how that works. And then for our specific people, we want them just to go like deep on like Facebook ads or YouTube ads. But the managers have to be good generalists and also good, kind of good at specialists. They're like T-shaped. Yeah. So with this gross respect to people's privacy, do you incentivize those managers beyond whatever you're paying? Um, it depends on what the department is. So like media buying absolutely has to be incentivized, you know, because it's, it's crucial. Um, strategy session people would have to be incentivized. But like, Customer support and other functions don't so much need to be incentivized. But we haven't really got our incentivization things like dialed in. This year I'm planning to roll in like stock options and things like that to make sure that everyone ha is an owner instead of an employee. Do you, do you incentivize on media buying based on ad spend or ROI? Profit on cash. Incentive. Well, the incentives must be aligned on the thing that's important. Right. Yeah. Because it, it, it seems like the, the vast majority of media buyers these days do it off ad spend or flat fee. Yeah. Because they don't want to get it. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's risk. Yeah. It's much better to have people align with profit. The incentives have to be aligned perfectly. Ours still aren't. We need to do things, we need to do a lot more there. 
because you know really stock options are the best in my eyes because that's long term like thinking plus i think jeff bezos said it best in his first letters to shareholders he said if we want to be the best and survive the long term we need a team of people who think and act like owners therefore they must actually be an owner because the only way to make someone truly think and act like one is to make them one same with sam walton i think he learned that from him because that's what he did he made everyone an owner so someone I, I someone recommended this one time i don't remember who it was or if it's in a book or whatever but they say like let's say you want to do let's say you don't have a youtube buyer right they say run a contest where you give everybody a thousand bucks and you get you get like five people in the contest you give them all a thousand dollars in ad spend and whoever you know does the best creates the most profit on cash gets the job you could do that what we did is we just went looking at like like media buyers who knew all the technical stuff had good experience and they were winning hard battles so like tommy was doing um he was media buying for like what do they call it cpa, yeah, CPA so he was doing media buying to like get leads for colleges and that's hyper competitive and it's also if you can make that work you're good and so like really good at that and nuanced at that and then jordan our facebook guy he was doing like affiliate offers on facebook so they knew the platform and everything but then we taught them everything we knew and it took them six months to get good you have to understand that no one's going to be real good until six months to a year but they have to you have to hire for potential and then make them good you're never going to find someone who comes in good and if you do you're going to pay through the nose for it but they don't really exist anyway so we're higher for potential, make them good. So generally the first couple of people, so in my case, once it gets a bit too much for me to do strategy sessions, the first couple of sales guys, I'm also potentially looking to move them into a management role as the business grows. So you're looking for that management trait in those first couple of guys as well, is that right? Yeah, sales might act differently, just because that function is like, sometimes sales people just want to keep hunting, they don't want to manage. Yeah. So you might want to bring a manager in. Um, but pretty much every other role, yeah, once someone gets good at it, they can become a manager. Yeah, because I don't want to hire a sales manager because that actually hasn't done it yourself. Just don't worry about the future, you need to start first. Yeah.